Welcome to Royal Roads University. My name is Dr. Jennifer Willinga. I'm a professor here at the University in the School of Communication and Culture. And welcome to episode nine of our webinar series, Olympism Part Two, Paralympism and the Paralympics. We have some fabulous guests who will be joining us. And of course, we're together for about 90 minutes and we have time always built in where participants can ask questions, but please feel free to post questions in the chat all the way along because things will occur to you. And we're happy to, uh, to invite you in at any time to participate in the conversation as well. So if you, even if you wanna turn your mic on, that would be great. It's really a discussion and an opportunity to learn together. Great to see lots of people joining us today. In the summer, it's quite a miracle when you have people attending the webinars, and I know people have so many webinars available to them. Uh, in sport, I'm so impressed actually with, with the way that people are embracing the platform. It's wonderful. And great to see people from all over uh, joining us. And some familiar faces, of course, good friends that I see online and joining. It's wonderful. We also have many people who signed up. We always have about 100 or so sign up for the webinar. So we also send out the recording. And that way people can, can benefit from some of the learning and conversation and follow up with questions, et cetera, and stay connected. It's quite a great network of people who are keen to see social change through sport. I always start with a bit of a spiel. And we always start by acknowledging the land on which rural roads resides. We want to acknowledge and thank the Lekwungen and Kwisupsum people, also known as Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations communities. They allow us to live and work and play and teach and learn on their lands. These are unceded territories. So we give thanks to the ancestors, supernatural ones, hereditary leaders and matriarchs, creatures big and small for looking after the rich resources and cultural teachings of this beautiful land. And I live on the same lands of the Lekwunga people. I'm in Cadbro Bay on, in uh, Victoria, BC, and working from home still. We are gradually making our way back to our campus in the fall. Uh, but this is where I really like to spend a lot of time on Elk Lake in my little rowboat. I was out there this morning and it was glassy just like that. And actually, I believe Megan and Samantha might, I didn't see Megan, but I know Sam was out there. So a great morning for all. We, we always want to acknowledge the lands, but also our history. And we've inherited, you know, some pretty tough history that we have to face and confront. And maybe we didn't, we didn't do the acts and we aren't responsible for those residential schools directly, but we are now responsible for the healing and the recovery and the re rehabilitation restitution work that needs to be done. Uh, we all have a part to play. We at Rural Roads, try very hard to not only learn from the land, from the environment, nature, and the communities around us, but to learn in community. It's part of our, our applied and very community-based model of transformational learning. We're a very social purpose university. All of our programs are dedicated to positive social change and work in a very interdisciplinary, interconnected uh, way. And we're really trying very hard as well to acknowledge our implicit biases and prejudices that we've inherited and try to be more conscious of the ways in which we're perpetuating some of these uh, discriminations. And today is about that too. You know, how do we how do we shift culture so that it is more inclusive? And the Paralympic movement is really part of that, trying to build a, a better, more inclusive world through para sport. We have partnerships with sport organizations, uh, in particular Game Plan. We work with them to welcome athletes into our university, partly because of our model. We, we acknowledge what people bring to the university. In fact, we expect people to bring professional learning from whatever context they derive. And sport is one of those. So we acknowledge not only that there has been learning that has happened through a sport career, but we uh, appreciate it. We acknowledge it and give it credit, you know, and, and we expect people to bring their learning into the cohort, into the community, the learning communities that they're operating within whatever program. This is Andrea Burke. She actually commentated at the Olympics recently for the Sevens Rugby, and she was my advisee doing her uh, thesis through the leadership program. I, I think it's just wonderful, the intersection of sport, leadership, social change, and, and all of our programs and that's why this webinar series was conceived really to leverage the concept of sport and all that sport offers the world in a really positive way. 
uh, to demonstrate and highlight the ways that sport can be a leader, that we can we can facilitate change within sport. Sport has its challenges, but also use sport, right, to foster positive change in the world. And of course, sport touches all of the areas that rural roads uh, educates within development, diversity and inclusion. We have programs in all of these areas, minus communication and culture, which of course I think is central to everything. <laughs> and in fact, it is, right? It's like the circulatory system of all the other learning that's going on. And you see those concepts reflected in so many sport organizations across the world. We also see athletes taking such a huge role. I know Hamish Bond in rowing made the comment that the athletes are the bottom of the pyramid also stand at the top of the pyramid. You know, if we think of sport as some sort of hierarchy, but they're, they're driving change as well. And we saw it at the Olympics. I wanted to highlight a couple of those things. And I know people saw these things at the Olympics, but, you know, think of Simone Biles and Ellie Black using their platform uh, to, to speak out for athlete welfare. Uh, we had Alison Felix, Mandy Bujol, Kim Gaucher from basketball and, and track and uh, boxing, fighting for maternity rights, right? The USA fencing team wore pink masks to protect se protest sexual violence against women. Canadian women's rugby team were making many statements in support of BIPOC rights, wearing orange ribbons and wristbands, among other things. U.S. shot putter uh, Raven Saunders represented intersectionality with her gesture on the podium. The intersectionality of all people who are oppressed. The Costa Rican, uh, Costa Rican gymnast Luciana Alvarado ended her floor routine by nailing, kneeling and raising a fist, right? But she embodied it within her floor routine. I thought it was very clever because of rule 50, there are some, of course, limitations. And the Japanese, Swedish, and US soccer teams all collaborated and in solidarity took a knee uh, prior to their game. So the athletes are using, leveraging their platforms and it's neat to watch since Rio, you know, it's, only, it's been five years, only five years, but also five full years and lots has changed in terms of communication and athletes learning how to leverage communication. They've always had a platform. You know, on the, I think Alison Felix was the one who said, what better platform than, the, than that metal um, podium? <laughs> so taking advantage of that platform to make a statement and bring people's attention to rights of human beings. But now they're realizing, wow, we have all of these media platforms as well at our fingertips and they're participating in all sorts of podcasts and developing their own and using Instagram and Twitter and uh, any kind of social media to, to their advantage to make their their opinions known and really participate in those discussions. I love it. I always like to highlight this metaphor of our school communication and culture. And I, you know, as I mentioned, I see communication and culture is really fundamental to a lot of positive social change in the world. Uh, culture is our values communicated. It can be aligned and, and integrated and, and positive and sustainable and have a lot of energy, uh, or it can be contradictory and in conflict and and actually sap our energy. But it really starts with this idea of good communication. And when we're talking about inclusion and diversity and embracing diversity, a bridge is fundamental, a uh, great little image for us in our school, because a bridge to build one demands that we recognize differences first. So we talk about minding the gap before bridging the gap, minding and understanding and being open to our differences, our diversity is, is really crucial to actually being able to build an effective bridge, whether it's a handshake, a hug, a conversation or an actual structure. And so welcome to our latest episode. Um, it will involve talking about the Paralympics and the Paralympic, uh, the Paralympic Games, but Paralympism as well and the concept of Paralympism. And I'll introduce very generally our guest right now, but then we'll all shut off my screen and we'll uh, get, to, uh, get a good look at them all. We have Gail Hamamoto, she's, Hamamoto sorry, she's joining us rejoining us because she was on a webinar probably a couple of months ago now the fantastic panel and I think we'll include that link in our recording uh, message to everybody because it was a really powerful one that I like to remind people of some amazing comments were made within it we had some great guests and Gail was one of those we were marveling before the webinar started at how much Gail accomplishes in her life <laughs> and all kind of feeling like wow she mustn't sleep really uh, we have Samantha Heron who I mentioned was out on the lake this morning. She is working as a recruiter and para coach with Rowing Canada, Rowing. 
and has multiple, speaking of being a busy girl, she has a lot uh, going on in her life as well, I know, because I supervise her thesis. So she's not only working on her master's, but also involved uh, volunteering in a number of different initiatives across sport, uh, but also then recruiting and taking on this new job of, of coaching in the Paris space. And we have Megan Montgomery, who is a teacher and rowing coach as well. And sorry for all the rowing, but you know, these are the people I know and they're nearby. And so I bring them in with that perspective. But uh, Megan is a, also a para athlete, went to the Rio Games where her four, a Cox four, so that means, and you kind of see this little person lying down here <laughs> in a boat. Uh, it's an it's a interesting kind of approach to coxing and are steering a boat, uh, they lie down in the bow and it actually gives them a perfect view of their course. Uh, but then they have a, a little microphone so the athletes can hear them, give them coaching and making calls through the race as well. That's Laura Court. But her four end up winning the bronze medal in Rio in 2016. And she's also a board member with Rowing BC. So here we have these fantastic guests who, who not only experience sport firsthand, but also now bring their leadership to sport, right? So as we spoke about earlier, that so many athletes are now giving back to sport. I want to remind people that you can choose a view so that you see the speaker, whoever's speaking at the time, or, you know, the key, the, the panel, or you can have a look at the gallery and, and might see some friend spaces in there as well, but you can manipulate what view you want during the webinar. Uh, you can also open up the chat where you'll see people posting lots of, uh, oh, right, that was Kit. Thanks, Janine, not Laura. Laura's in the four now. Um, but you can start seeing some of the questions that people are posting or where they're from. We often ask people to share where they're coming from or what sport they're involved in or what's drawn them to the webinar. And it's just great to see uh, a, a sense, get a sense of who's in the room with us. And now let's get going. I've got a, a few questions to guide us through, but people tend to build on what others are saying and, and topics arise. And please feel free to share your thoughts and questions in the chat as well. We'll try to monitor that as we go. And let's get started. So I've given just a brief, you know, some background kind of resume type background for our guests, but I always like to start by asking them to introduce themselves a little more to within the context of sport, you know, why sport, what drew you to sport, and what drew you to para in particular, uh, what, what helped you get involved, but what do you love about sport, because you're all still very involved in devoting a lot of your time to the world of sport, to supporting athletes and, and other sport participants. Anybody like to start? Great, Gail's ready to go. Thanks, Gail. Go I'll hop in. Um, I, I grew up in sport, you know, I think as many of us do, trying everything as you should when you're little. Um, and then got into giving back through coaching and through uh, serving on boards and things like that. But um, very luckily, serendipitously, uh, was introduced to BC Wheelchair Sports completely by accident. Um, they posted a position. Uh, it was a part-time position to help with the maternity leave and uh, my world changed. Uh, I, I wasn't, this wasn't my career path. I didn't know sport admin was even a thing back then. I'm old. Uh, so, and, and I was gonna leave the organization and, and the then executive director, who's a legend, Kathy Newman um, said, you know, what can, we, what can we do to have you stay? And I was like, no, I'm going, I have this path. I'm you know, very goal driven. I'm only going to be here for a couple of years. And uh, but at the end of the day, when I really thought about my values and what was important to me and what I wanted to say that I had done at the end of my career it was to make a difference in people's lives. And BC Wheelchair Sports offered me that opportunity. And um, I, I treasure the relationships and the, and the athletes and the members and, um, you know, the gift that it's given me in my life. Uh, and I think that for me, to be able to have the privilege of having a career where you are able to impact um, not just individuals, but families and communities. It's an incredible blessing. And I always say we're so fortunate because in our organization, we get to um, have that experience where someone tries sport for the very first time. It might be post-injury, it might be a child that was born with a disability um, and to watch the light go on about the potential and um, the community that they can become a part of and that um, path that they can now see is priceless. And then we also get 
the pure high performance sport driven side that just feeds my com competitive nature in hosting world championships and, and supporting athletes to Paralympic Games and all of that. So, so we have this wonderful combination of the both. Um, and so I've been there for 27 years and, you know, it's just, it gets in your blood. Yeah, so you were three when you joined. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding, thank you, Gail. Isn't that interesting, the serendipity and yet it speaks to your, you know, sometimes we don't recognize our values in action, do we? Or that they're calling us, awesome. Thank you. I'm glad you responded to that call. And Sam, I can see you nodding. Do you want to follow in there? Yeah, I will jump in. So uh, unlike Gail, I did not try every sport going up. And um, rowing was that only sport that I was ever really good at back in the day. And so I really went down that athlete journey for a while. But then quite young, I got involved uh, just kind of by chance in coaching uh, in 2015. And then I was very fortunate to get some roles that have allowed me to go down this career pathway that I never thought I would be in. Uh, sport for me has always been very much a medium in which people express their values and what's important to them. Uh, and I've always seen that with the athletes I work with as well as myself and the group of athletes that I trained with. And so I'm really not a sport nerd, but I am a people nerd. And I love that opportunity to work with people in this space. Um, and I always feel a lot of gratitude for working in sport because in some senses, it is almost a privileged space um, where people really have an opportunity to just strive and chase and, um, and connect with a community, if that makes sense. And so then, as I worked in that pathway, this role uh, as a para coach and recruiter came up for me a couple of months ago. Um, and, and I've always um, had a real interest in a job that combines coaching as well as sport administration. And that's what this role was. Uh, and then similar to Gail, I can't, if, I, if I'm in sport for the rest of my career, I can't imagine leaving the para sports space because um, what I really find is uh, people are really good at being a community in the para-sports space, and it also reflects a little bit more of that holistic look we want on sport, on human and social development, on um, health as a person, right, on how you uh, express yourself within your sport experience, and I'm so proud of the group of athletes that I work with because um, I'm having, a, they're putting their hands up to be on diversity, equity, and inclusion committees, and they're disability advocates, and they're training 20 hours a week uh, as they pursue education, right? And so they're this really nuanced group of athletes who also are definitely, uh, and we have a lot of little jokes, but also just facing ableism and some of the stigma in sport. And so um, I just get really, and it takes a lot for me to like get excited and fired up, but I get really excited by this group. And um, so I just feel very fortunate to be in this space. Beautiful. And you've, I take notes as I go, but yeah, you raise, you raise so many concepts as well of that idea that it's a, it's a springboard for leadership. It's a springboard for teaching other other aspects of our society, you know, these core values. And Megan, what drew you to sport? What drew you to para? Um, well, I um, I think I'll, I'll start with a little bit of background. I was born uh, with a congenital disability. So um, I was born, put it on the screen, I was born without a full hand. I was actually born without any fingers at all. And through surgery was given, um, they were able to get the thumb and then, um, yeah the other fingers are fused. So I have limited grip. Um, my dad is was a PE teacher, now retired. Um, so sport was very much part of our household. And he was also a high level volleyball coach. So um, in some ways, sport wasn't really an option for me. I needed to be involved. And I, I was put in all sorts of activities, um, no, most notably soccer, which um, probably would have been the best sport not I wouldn't have had to use my hands but um, it's not what I loved and I explored other sports I played volleyball um, I played basketball and I played water polo so a lot of hand usage um, 
So it, it really provided me with an opportunity to grow up with some confidence. And um, I didn't know that I classified for any Paralympic sports. That was not something that anyone had ever taught me or and because of the lack of awareness of parasport in the 80s and 90s, um, it just wasn't something I knew about. Um, so yeah, it, um, it was in my second year of university that I was missing uh, that competitive sport environment and those friendships that, we, um, that you form in those communities. So I um, was approached um, going, walking across the University of Manitoba campus. They said, oh, you're tall and you um, are wearing a UBC sweatshirt. You must, you must row because you know the West Coast. And um, I just thought, you know what, why not? I'm going to go check it out. And um, there was actually a part of me that thought that I was going to be told I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, but instead, I found a very supportive community. And um, I was very keen to make it happen for myself. And I had a great group of people surrounding me who wanted to make it happen for me as well. Um, so yeah, I competed for Team Manitoba in the 2001 Canada Summer Games. And um, para sport or para rowing wasn't on uh, the, the docket in para, the Paralympics yet. It wasn't until 2000, uh, 2008 that that was gonna be the first para games. So um, 2004 was the first uh, world championships that Paralympics para rowing was um, involved. So um, yeah, it was 2006 that I represented Canada for the first time. And it, um, it has been an amazing journey um, for me. I, I know growing up that I had always been looking for someone like me and, and that sort of community. And so para, the Paralympics and the um, para rowing has just kind of opened that community up and opened my eyes to a whole other world and a passion I didn't even know I had. So I will always remain involved in some way or another, whether it be board member or um, coach. Yeah, it's, uh, it's what I love to do. <laughs> Pulled in and not allowed to leave, right? I'm got, sorry, I'm going to mute myself because I've got construction going on. And just as Megan started talking, the excavator arrived. So uh, I'll try to remember to unmute. Oh, my God. And Megan, thank you so much. Great stories, too. Right now, we all have a sense of uh, this sort of how we arrive at things in this serendipitous way, as, as Gail mentioned, but also in a way that's so aligned with who we are and our values and what we're sort of searching for. Okay? Love the everybody's mentioned this idea of community and how strong it is within para. And, and we can say it probably is across sport, but not all sport. I would say there are some that struggle or there are issues, but uh, pretty much across the board, it seems like para really seems to embody that concept of support and community and problem solving. Stephanie Dixon was on, I think the same webinar with Gail or maybe one just before that. And she talked about the same thing, Megan, of, of just swimming. You know, I'm just swimming. I'm with these kids. I, it wasn't even mentioned the concept of para because, again, it wasn't a thing uh, until later. And, and then it became uh, something that she would pursue. But, but that almost seemed to help her, right, in a way to realize that Meh, I, I'm just swimming. I like swimming. I want to swim. And so thank you for the, those background um, anecdotes and stories and the, the journeys that we can now all envision. Can, yesterday, uh, Sam and Megan, and I wanted to kind of start with this as a bit of a foundational piece that we can all keep in our minds, because it is central to the conversation today of Paralympism and some of the concepts and values and the vision of the IPC that we want to touch on. But you, you were both participating in a webinar for Rowing Canada, and it was around language in particular, and kind of equipping people with the language that, that they should be adopting and and the reasons why and I wanted to give you a chance both of you Sam and Megan to maybe mention a few of the things that emerged yesterday during that webinar that we can build on or keep in mind anything you want to highlight yeah I can jump in I think um, as I've come up to speed in my role over the last couple of months well we've done a good job of getting to where we're at. I really do believe that our spaces are not inclusive and accessible uh, to the extent that they should be. And almost to the point where we have to say to people, this has to shift from a nice to have to an actual right for 
everybody accessing the environment. Um, and that people first language for me is about shifting that attitude and being comfortable uh, challenging some of that inherent, um, whether it's ableism or exclusive behavior or what have you, because sport can be very elite at times. Um, instead of going, well, let's have a shift in attitude. And that really links to the language we use uh, as a starting point. And Jill Wolflinger, who was presenting, she did a really good job about saying, it doesn't actually cost anything to, to do that shift in attitude. And then from there, we can start to put our minds together and get a little bit more creative on how we do capacity building and resource building for more inclusive and accessible spaces. Uh, so that's what I was kind of starting with, with the idea for this webinar. Um, and also just starting to engage our community a little bit more about, okay, what do we actually need to do in these spaces? And so Megan, I don't know what your thoughts are on that as well from being a guest on yeah, it, I thought it um, like the real simple take home is instead of instead of saying uh, wheelchair athlete, you should say an athlete who uses a wheelchair because you want to address the person, so the athlete first, and then their mode of participating in their given sport. So yeah, just really identifying that the person is first, and then the disability is second. Beautiful. And that is the, the key, the core, eh? Valuing people as people. Thank you. Um, what I noticed when I, one of the questions I shared with you earlier, and, and uh, again, as I said, we'll probably go in different directions, but I'm, you know, we've done a couple of sessions on Olympism and the Olympic values emerge often in our conversations about what we're trying to promote through sport. You know, this idea of yes, striving for excellence, but also with respect and friendship and the idea of community building. When I look at the IPC vision, um, it differs slightly from the IOC vision. So IOC vision is to build a better world through sport. IPC, uh, Inter International Player Olympic Committee, is make for an inclusive world through parasport, which to me is better. <laughs> you know, it falls under that concept of better, but more it's more specific. Uh, inclusive inclusion being the real solution and the IPC values are different in that they're courage determination inspiration and equality what do you think about the differentiation do you think it's necessary is it a part of a, a process or what are your thoughts on on those distinct values and visions between the two organizations Gail go ahead uh I think it is important. I think that there is, I mean, obviously I believe in, in the power of sport for everyone, but I think that there's nothing more powerful than, than sport for people with disabilities. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I listened recently to um, a panel that Chantal Petzclair and Steph, uh, Stephen Dixon were on, because I always think it's more powerful to come from the voice of the actual athletes. I mean, I'm an administrator, I'm able-bodied, so it's not my voice that should be heard, it should be theirs. Um, and, um, you know, one of the stories that Chantal told was, when she was uh, in the 2008 Beijing games and she won a medal um, after winning that medal, she, I mean, she won five medals, but after winning one of the medals, uh, she received a letter from parents whose um, young child had just had an accident and sustained a spinal cord injury. And that letter essentially said um, that seeing her win that medal gave them hope and, and, and helped them see the future. And what, what Chantal said in her, her quote was, sport is more than sport and it can change the world. And I 100% and I believe that, you know, and, um, and, and so that's why I think the Paralympic values and the, and the, and the impact of, of what we do is just that much more, um, more important or, or, or more meaningful. You know, Stephanie Dixon on the same panel said, you know, the Paralympics allow us to change the way we look at human potential, uh, which I, I just really resonates with me. Uh, I just think uh, there's nothing more powerful than seeing someone, as, as Megan said earlier, seeing someone uh, who is similar to you, who is a peer, doing things that you now will aspire to do or could aspire to do. So I, I certainly think that there's so much more. And I, and I referenced it when I said why I'm involved in parasport in the first place. Um, yeah, I love sport. I, I'm a sport junkie. However, parasport is something uh, even more so. Um, if I can add maybe a story or two to, to what Gail just said. Um, this week, I someone reached out 
to me through social media to say, I've just found out that the baby I'm carrying is going to be born without a hand. And I was wondering if I could ask you some questions from your perspective. So that power of um, that visibility is, is so important. Um, so I you know, will be meeting with this uh, future parent um, about some of my perspectives of, of what they can do to support their child. Um, and that's powerful and I've got a little few tears already, but um, even for myself, like uh, Canadian Tires just put out a, a beautiful uh, synchronized swimming um, uh, commercial with girls swimming and putting their hands up. And then the last person, the last girl to put her hands up is uh, someone who doesn't have a full hand in it. it again, tears to my eyes because the little girl in me who was so desperate to see someone uh, doing what um, I was doing and, and just to be able to have a connection that I'm not the only one um, was she felt seen. Um, but also one last story, I at the uh, 2012 Paralympic Games, uh, my teammate and I, um, Victoria Nolan, she I was guiding her through the, the tube system. And we happened to sit down across the aisle from a mom and her two children. And um, we were both wearing Canadian stuff, we had just been to a wheelchair basketball game. So the woman reached, you know, started a conversation with us asking where we were from, etc. And I'm fairly certain she thought I was a guide. Um, but as I was sitting there looking at her kids and finding pins to, to share with these little kids, I noticed her little girl's hand. And it was very similar to mine. She had five nubs, but not, um, it wasn't a fully grown hand. And so I <laughs> immediately was, oh, me too. <laughs> and had a very brief moment because their stop was the next stop, but had a very brief moment where she was very overwhelmed. Her mother wanted her to answer or ask all the questions. Um, but we had a very mo brief moment where um, hopefully uh, she was inspired to see that there's, there is something else out for their else out there for her because she wasn't um, participating in sports. So yeah, I hope it inspired me. I don't know how it did for her, but it was a, a wonderful moment, yeah. And I'm so glad you mentioned that commercial, Megan, because when I was preparing for this, that's one of the things that came up for me. And, and the fact that it was throughout the Olympic broadcast, because uh, those of us in our community, we're gonna watch the Paralympics. We're gonna be you know, seeing all of that coverage and, um, and that's one thing, but but the fact that all the eyes that were on the Olympic coverage saw that commercial, saw Toyota's commercials, that for me was enormous because like you, you know, we didn't see that 10, 20 years ago at all. And um, if, not only for participants to see or potential participants to see themselves, but also now the work that us as sport administrators are gonna do, talking to facilities, talking to um, able-bodied sport organizations, all those, those people that have now had that kind of exposure and seen that, and it now furthers our ability to do the good work that we need to do to make sure that there are opportunities for people in the future. Yeah, and I'll jump in on top of that as well, because that visibility piece linking to awareness has been huge. And I've just been working through, and poor Jen has to read it, this thesis proposal that's talking about um, basically that intersection between the parasport system and our non para system and the evolution it's gone through, but as well as a bit of the complexities around it in terms of what do we actually want the system to look like and what do people need to know about a system that I believe should be nuanced to allow for the people who access it to access it fully, if that makes sense. And it's been interesting over the last couple of weeks, like uh, there was a short little documentary put out by uh, a, it's a Paralympic podcast where they were talking about para athletes who want to transition to coaching and why that is such a challenging pathway, right? And first of all, most people are going, well, we just never see, with the exception of Megan, right? We never see para athletes who transition to coaches and what does that specific pathway look like? what accessibility considerations need to exist for me to do that because I had one of the athletes that I work with um, one day she was injured so she came out in the safety launch with me but transferring from her chair to the safety launch can be a bit challenging because nobody's ever thought about well who needs to access the coach boats right versus the rowing shells that they're accessing um, and then the same athlete when I think about, well, what is visibility doing in sport? We actually, because I really believe in that multi-sport space, um, 
we just went on an adaptive mountain bike series that was the first ever to exist in the world. Um, and she was the only female athlete entered, but it was the starting point of all of these other women who were watching it, reaching out going, well, how do I get in this bike? And how do I start, you know, hurling myself down a mountain at 80 kilometers an hour with all of these other very extreme adaptive mountain bikers? But it is that visibility piece of going, okay, we can do it. This is how. I can't believe you were there, Samantha. I was there as well. Um, and, yeah, and I just, I loved that they took the opportunity to speak to, like Ethan Kruger took the opportunity, one of the athletes took the opportunity to speak at the, at the uh, riders meeting to all of the other riders. So, you know, there are 300 plus able-bodied riders and he just, you know, talked about the importance of having an adaptive division. Um, they had good visibility. It, it was celebrated. It was, it was a really neat experience. It was a, a incredibly like special week right and um no these athletes are just so like gail i i was doing the trail gunning which is where you bike down behind them yes. and i was holding on for dear life the whole way down mm -hmm. right it was so good very cool you know we often oh, I, I was just writing so many things down because i don't want to lose the the threads but um you know we talk about sport being a bit of a blueprint it can it has the potential to be a real blueprint for the society because it can be people at their best, it can be. But it feels like, it sounds like, the more I hear about the para world is, that is the blueprint. <laughs> you know, and they're doing things so well. Even an event where they take advantage of the opportunity to actually have a conversation or, you know, highlight, speak to, um, create leadership opportunities. And uh, I'm reading a comment here from one of our participants, and it's another story where she encounters, and you can have a look at it in the chat, but that attitude, and Gail, you referenced this in the last webinar as well about the sort of one-offs, or we don't have enough people who require these uh, special accessibilities uh, in terms of coach boat or access to a building or whatever, and so we'll just deal with the one-off. No, that you're missing the whole point, right, and how do we, how do we convey and, and heightened this the need for a broader more inclusive attitude in general um what do you think what are some of your answers to that yeah challenge? yeah I, I think that's critical critical because some people may ask many people will not ask or will not even see the opportunity or will, and so you're going to lose the vast majority of people that you know, as, as, as I can't remember, was it was it Samantha said, it, it, it's a right. This is not a nice to have. This is not a, we should do this. This is, we're well past that stage. This is a right. This is what we should do across the board in sport and society. Um, and if we're not doing it, we're not fulfilling our responsibilities. Uh, and I'm <laughs> like, uh, I think after 27 years, I said to, I said to another panel like, a couple of years ago, I'm tired of singing Kumbaya. I want us to use the leaders that we have, the levers that we have, whether they're financial, whether they're regulatory, whatever they might be, to say that's enough. We're at the point now where every Canadian has a right to access sport and physical activity. And as administrators and organizations, we have to do what's necessary. Whether we think it's one person or 500 people, it's our, it's our, it's basic human right. So I stop yelling, but. <laughs> Right? Oh my it God. has to be said it's just it's i've had enough of people saying well there's not enough money or there's not enough resources there's, well change the way you do it from day one don't do it and then figure out the adaptation start with the end in mind start with with the inclusive environment in mind and that's cultural change because fundamental to any way of doing is a governing kind of assumption or algorithm that drives our behaviors, our actions. And what we're seeing right now is this assumption that there's one sort of supreme being that has, has access and the rest have to write a letter or ask or look at the soccer women, right? Having to request, go through the pain and distraction of requesting a, a time to play their game that is equal to what others are, are getting. Yeah, this strange hierarchy of, of value of human beings is crazy. So the para sport world is really uh, exposing that assumption powerfully. Okay, so rallying leaders, getting everybody riled up like we are right now <laughs> to uh, make these changes, but expecting things to be different from day one. And, and I think key to that as well is respecting intersectionality. 
So um, a person is not just a person with disability or just an able-bodied person. They bring their whole selves to the to the table. And I think we're seeing that more and more. We saw it more through the Olympic Games with, with Quinn on the national soccer team with, um, that won the gold medal. Um, we're seeing it in uh, the parasite uh, with some of our athletes. It, you know, we have to look at the whole self. At BC Wheelchair Sports, we're in the very early stages of creating our Indigenous Bridging the Gap program. I love that you talked about Bridging the Gap at the beginning, because that's the name of our recruitment and development program. Uh, and we realized that we, we had a complete lack of knowledge about in the Indigenous community and how we were serving them or not really not serving them. And so we have engaged in a journey of learning uh, and relationship building so that we can help um, do do better uh, and, and in, ensure that people who come from Indigenous communities see themselves in adaptive sport and know how to access and are supported in accessing sports. So um, I think intersectionality is a really important part of recognizing what we're doing. Yes, yes, because it's similar, similar challenges across. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, no, well, I just, I love, Gail, what you're saying about the whole self, because I think that that is where, when we look back on this past Olympics and you listen to all of the athlete voices, that was really coming out, right? And we can easily talk about what Simone Biles did and how absolutely influential that was for how we look at sport moving forward. Um, and then I, and I also get, yeah, like fired up by this comment, right, about the one-offs, because it's just simply... Um, not a one-off. And, and what we've seen is this very privileged space in sport exists for so long, right? Mm -hmm. um, and sorry to the white men out there, right? <laughs> but that's been that, that narrative for a very long time. Um, and we just struggle to understand, well, what does it look like for everybody else in this space? And I remember um, I went through a crazy bike accident four years ago now and I came away with that with a traumatic brain injury and permanent cognitive challenge. I was, I'll just deal with it for the rest of my life for the most part. Um, and I was so, I remember going through and being so embarrassed to go through a workplace and through my um, educational institution to go, well, this is what I need to show up and be you know, competent and confident in this space. And I was, but I also had so many opportunities where I chose how I presented and I could do that. And I know that not everybody else has that, right? And so it's just building that awareness of what a, a spectrum of, of human beings we are and how we all show up and then, and then really being strong. And I like, I, who was it in the chat? It was what you said, Judy, about being stronger with our language to go, we don't have time to have this conversation about one-offs anymore, right? It's getting a little bit, um, yeah, it's just not really there, right? And then at some point you just slap people with the duty to accommodate, right? And we get into that legalese side of it to, to also help build capacity. And I think that, you know, we referenced earlier about um, para-athletes and the, and the power of their voice. And, and, and I know certainly uh, with the athletes that I've had the, the privilege of working with, they, they give back like, you know, beyond what uh, what I experienced uh, in the able-bodied sports system. And, and I just wanted to shine a light on Cindy Ouellette, Ou 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 sorry, as um, we were referencing Simone Biles, you know, we we're looking at a para-sport example of, of similar things. Cindy Cindy's not only spoken out about um, being a member of the LGBTQ plus community, but also most recently she spoke about uh, very significant mental health challenges coming through COVID and, and, and leading to um, qualifying for the Paralympic Games. And, and Cindy's an, a phenomenal uh, multi-sport athlete, Paralympian, uh, and a strong, strong athlete voice. And she's willing to be vulnerable in a very public space um, and, and be that role model uh, for all the right reasons. Uh, so I just think it's really important that we acknowledge and recognize voices like Cindy's uh, in conversations like this. Yeah, it's really the athletes that are driving a lot of change, aren't they? You know, I wanted to highlight a bunch and we look forward to so many in the next Paralympic Games as well. And I am sensing a sea change around the Paralympics through media and social posts. I love that quote about it may not, my life may not be easy, but it's going to be amazing. Great. That was beautiful. Um, and we're celebrating promoting the Paralympics more than I've ever seen before. It ends up always being this kind of add on and people by then they're kind of Olympic fatigue sets in, I don't know what happens, but there's not as much, you know, um, engagement and it feels like there will be this time. 
So what do you think that change is about? Do you think it is, you know, a lot of the athlete voices, a lot of these just efforts coming from all different angles, new policy, talking about it more or, or what else? And what are some more opportunities you, that you see for para sport, Paralympic games, para athletes? Um, I'm going to jump on this one. Um, as someone who's been to three Paralympic Games, I've really seen it evolve. Um, and I have to say that uh, the London Games really did a wonderful job of, of putting out the Paralympic Games as a major event, not just for London, but their entire country. And they did a, also did an amazing job of covering the event. So I was back in the rowing village able to turn on the TV and watch para swimming, watch para cycling. And the other thing that they did was they educated along the way. Like this, this is, um, I'm not going to get any of the names right in terms of classifications, but like this is this event and this is the different potential disabilities that'll be in this event. Um, and so they have to fit in with this criteria. So there's education on top of it. And I really think that, um, we missed we missed an opportunity in 2010 to do that in Canada, and I really think that it's not so much that the general public doesn't want to watch or doesn't want to hear about it; it's the access to it. And I'm really really excited to see that uh, the Paralympic Games will be on prime time on CBC. I think that's going to be huge for our the development, um, the grassroots, and just the overall performances of our athletes. So it's very exciting. Well, it's like in 2016, right, where there was this argument, it almost didn't happen, Paralympic Games almost, yeah, and then the argument being, well, you know, people don't really want to watch, and of course, more crowds than ever showed up for those, and thank God it, it went off, and there were enough people rallying and fighting, but yes, and that's the same argument we get as women, right, that, oh, well, people don't want to watch your sports, and therefore, we won't put it on, but when you do, it's amazing, when you do fund, <laughs> oh, wow, people actually go, women's rugby is a good example of that, okay, what else? What else, what are the opportunities? What, what else do we need to keep kind of stoking the fire on or getting behind? I think building on what Megan is saying too, I think the, the emergence of different viewing platforms has really served the Paralympic movement well. So we weren't reliant just on television uh, and, and you know we were waiting for them to catch up and realize that there was an audience, but at the same time, we could build an online viewing uh, platform, the Canadian Paralympic Committee really latched onto that. I mean, I'm just looking at the data now. I think we have 120 hours of original hours on TV, and then we have an additional 600 plus hours on um, streaming platforms. So um, I mean, dinosaurs like me, we watch the television, but I know my staff are all just watching it streaming. And uh, I think that's a, another amazing opportunity, a real equalizer, uh, not only in Canada, but around the world in terms of, of getting that visibility and creating that awareness. And Megan highlighted the power of educating while we are, while we are um, streaming or or showing it on CBC or CTV or NBC or whatever, but actually investing that time and energy into making an educational experience. And I wish that was for all sport, actually, um, not just about the event, but about what's happening and what they're learning and what they're showing. Right? You know, the concepts that sport can actually teach. Great. What else? What are some other opportunities that you see awaiting uh, para sport, para athletes? I think that there's an incredible convergence right now of the kind of work that people have been doing for two decades to create the foundation, to advocate, to, to knock on the door and bang the door down over and over and over again. And all of the social movements that we saw coming through this COVID phase, whether it's the Me Too movement, whether it's Black Lives Matter, all of this sort of now awareness of, you know what, it's not okay anymore. Uh, the way that we've been doing things is not okay anymore. Uh, and so I just see this, you know, the combination of the, found the foundation that's been built and the passion and the social change. And I just think if we can leverage it right now for Parasport, as we build our system coming out of COVID um, and, and we put our foot down and say, this is the way it has to be. I think that there's just a golden moment for us to really take it to the next level. Beautiful. And COVID really has been a definer. Uh, crises tend, we always, there's a great quote, never waste a good crisis. And they do, right? A uh, crisis reveals what's important because you grab, you know, they're talking about the wildfires, grab what you love, uh, what's most important to you. And that's what happens figuratively too during a crisis. We end up really highlighting what's important to us. So that's probably helping. What are some of the barriers that we still face? 
Yeah, I'll jump in on this one because I was reflecting on that COVID piece and I, um, through COVID is when I transitioned into this role and I was watching athletes in the Paris space still experience many more barriers simply to returning to sport compared to their able-bodied counterparts because of how you had to navigate uh, restrictions. And um, so for example, uh, uh, one of our visually impaired athletes that I work with, he usually needs to roll with somebody else to be able to navigate the waterway um, and being able to kind of work through and be creative with what that would look like while still honoring COVID restrictions was really challenging for people to wrap their minds around. Um, and, but it also kind of exposed that people were very quick to go, we can't simply accommodate, right? And so it's going, how do we manage the complexity through some of these things that get highlighted in those crisis moments? Um, and then I also really think that we need to be able to figure out how to amplify voices into more of the leadership spaces. Like that's really, really missing for me um, is seeing that diversity in the people making the decisions, right? And so working through right now, for example, and I go back to that athletes to coaches piece, why don't athletes really see themselves being able to go into that leadership role? And what does everybody else see is missing from supporting them into that role, right? Why are we not going, because you do that with Olympians all the time, you go, you, should, you clearly seem to know a lot about the sport, why aren't you coaching, right? Well, in my opinion, the para-athletes have a huge ability to advocate, to manage complexity, to do the whole athlete piece, we need to amplify those skills and move them into those leadership positions. Yet there still seems to be a bit of a restriction to why that doesn't actually exist. Yeah, and and so currently at BC Wheelchair Sports, all of our provincial coaches, with the exception of our seated throws coach, are our former athletes with a disability. Um, so we've had to navigate that for sure over many years. And one of the barriers that we came up against that I think is gradually getting better, but could probably still use some work, were the coaching education programs that had built in um, assumptions that the person taking the course would be able-bodied and would be able to do the things required of an able-bodied person. And so there was a lot of, again, when we talk about the, the exceptions needed to be made as opposed to it being baked in at the beginning. And so uh, I would really uh, emphasize the need for inclusive coach education programs um, for mentorship. Mentorship was, because in Parasport, um, a lot of those coach education programs provided a limited amount of information, but didn't provide the, whole, the, whole, the you know, really holistic information that a coach would need. We really relied on and continue to rely on mentorship opportunities. Uh, and not just for uh, athletes with disabilities transitioning to coaching roles in parasport, for, but for all coaches in parasport, just because there's a richness of information from a senior coach, um, particularly as it relates to para-athletes and the breadth of diversity that they um, uh, have in their athletes. That, that is is really critical to being successful as a coach. So that was critical. Um, but I think you need to target athletes and, and have those very specific conversations with them. Recognize the value, as you say, Samantha, like just nobody knows it better than they know it. And that doesn't necessarily mean an athlete is gonna be an amazing coach, but they certainly have the foundation to be um, you know, developed into an amazing coach. And I also think challenge our idea of what the pathway looks like. I was watching this video or some, something the other day where there is a female sledge hockey player who's on the Canadian sledge hockey team um, who is coaching the Great Britain men's team, sledge hockey team. She lives over there. She will come obviously over and compete with her team and her coach for her own sledge hockey like pathway is incredibly supportive of it. And so, it was just going like, what a creative way to make this work. And we need to be comfortable with that creativity and just kind of like shifting from our very constricted norms that we have to going, there's lots of ways to make this work. Funny, Stephanie, I, was, I wanted to highlight, Stephanie Dixon mentioned this in uh, one of the webinars that what she found being a para-athlete para was that she appreciated the creativity, the problem solving, the resourcefulness that it actually made her feel stronger, more empowered, more equipped um, to perform and just to be to be a creative person 
And again, I think, you know, this, this context um, pr promotes, highlights the power of having to problem solve together collaboratively, but and find unique ways. Because again, women in coaching find the same barriers in that it's an assumption that you won't have kids or something, <laughs> which is crazy. And so how do we bake it in at the beginning and allow for different pathways that are unique? Yeah. And the, some of these athletes face the same thing going to the Olympics, right? And I think it's critically important in this conversation that um, whether it's from an administrator point of view or a coach point of view is that the athlete voice is respected with, you know, in terms of that creativity requires a coach to ask the athlete and to invite the athlete to be part of the solution, not to think, you know, we have this traditional um, uh, model of coaching where you direct or you, you, you have all the knowledge and you, you impart it on your athletes, but particularly in parasport, that, that, that model is, is not going to serve you very well. You have to respect, understand, honor the experience of the athlete and what they bring to the table in that solution. Um, and, and that's, it's such a different collab. Well, I shouldn't say different because it should be the same on the able-bodied side. And I'm sure it is in, in the best cases. Uh, but that's gotta be part of the solution is that collaborative, uh, path for an athlete and a coach together. So again, para sport being the ideal in so many ways, teaching sport, the way it needs to be partnership, collaborative, problem solving, resourceful assumptions that are about rights. Yeah. Okay. Nicely said, Sam. And you and I have talked about that too, right? That you're discovering that as you enter the space, that there's so much ideal there. Other barriers, though, that we're still having to tackle, not to be negative, but I just think, you know, if you don't confront them, we can't resolve them. So what are some other I mentioned stigma? Is there still that sense of stigma around disability? Are there still? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't want to monopolize the conversation, so I want Megan and, and Sam jump in, but I, I can give you the list of barriers if you like. <laughs> I think, yeah, like when I think about it, um, there's very uh, patronizing attitudes towards athletes with a disability, and, and I've seen it in a couple of different competitions where an athlete, like you have, let's say, a non-para athlete and a para athlete, they do the same thing. Why and the non-para athlete doesn't get clapped for crossing the finish line, but the para athlete does, right? And you're like, ooh, like that's a sticky, yucky moment when that happens, right? Um, because it is that there's this almost, um, yeah, infantilization of athletes, right, in the space, and uh, and we have to challenge those pieces a little bit. And that will, in my opinion, links back to that people first language in terms of seeing as people as people and as adults, right? Um, and then and so that's a really big challenge. The other one that I see is just simply resource and resource allocation, right? Um, when I look at clubs that are trying to build and rowing specifically, trying to build para rowing programs, they need resources to fund like equipment, adaptations to equipment, um, coach and leadership knowledge building, mm -hmm. as well as athlete support. And we just don't always quite understand what that resource needs to look like and how it needs to be nuanced to support uh, a para system. And then when you, when you do have that knowledge, then there's a resistance on the organization's part to actually allocate those resources because there's this artificial calculation of well it's only this many athletes compared to the able-bodied athletes and therefore we can't we can't justify allocating that amount of resource to this small pocket of and it it, it is not an equity equation that they they, they look at it's not a rights-based equation it's this outdated model of number ratio of number of membership to allocation of resources which has to stop um, and so that's a huge barrier, I think, systemically uh, from grassroots all the way to the national sport organizations that, that we need a culture change. Yeah, just um, reading what Jody, uh, Judy wrote, um, equality versus equitable. I'm also a teacher and I think about that often in my classroom. Like if I'm teaching, um, Actually, it's a diagram. It's an image of um, you know a giraffe being able to get the leaves off the tree, and the fish in the fishbowl can't get it. And so these are the students of my classroom. How am I going to get the fish to leaves so that they are equal in this situation? So it's very much that idea of how do we raise everybody up to the same level? 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, if we look at barriers and we look at, you know, the, the marathon runner needs a pair of running shoes that costs, I don't know, a few hundred dollars, maybe they're bajillion, but, but a, a wheelchair racer needs a, a racing chair that can be anywhere from if you start $3,000 to if you're a world champion, goodness gracious, I don't know, twenty thirty thousand dollars um, to get a piece of equipment. So, uh, and again, not a nice to have a, a right. You need, they need this to get started. And so uh, when we, when we say to um, a provincial sport organization, you must include an athlete with a disability, that needs to go along with an understanding of the resources required. So um, it's nice for a provincial government to say, you have to include an athlete with a disability. Okay, let's understand that there's a price tag to that and let's resource them properly or give them the knowledge and the tools and the understanding to go and tackle that themselves as well. But just don't give them one piece about the education part about what does that really mean and how are we going to do this in an effective way? I think that that education piece is so key, Gail, because uh, so often we really watch coaches or leaders in these systems get very afraid when they get tasked with that mandate, right? And they, and it's overwhelming often at times to understand how you need to do your resource allocation. And so it's that real um, fine line between the, this is the right in the environment, and then this is how we walk lockstep together with the resources and the education needed to make it happen, right? but it does take a group of people being on the same page and collaborating together on that. Excellent. So expect, expect it's going to cost more, uh, but to do the right thing, it costs more. And we need to just accept that. This idea of questioning old metrics, like these assumptions, again, that, um, that drive our thinking around how we allocate, you know, and what fair means, quite, shake that up. And um, fear, people are just afraid, They're afraid of, I mean, God, I enter into these webinars sometimes and I'm like, oh God, I'm going to say all sorts of terrible things that I don't even know I'm saying and it's going to fall out of my mouth and be terrible. But I, I trust that everyone I invite in is going to be compassionate and help me out, you know, that we're in it together and we're all learning and we're all, we've all inherited these terrible things that make us say stuff that isn't very sensitive without even realizing. So that is a big deal too, the fear um, and then again, just these, these prejudices people have inherited that, that make it stigmatized, make it awkward for, uh, or make someone uh, like James, your athlete, have to ask for a partner, you know, hello, and be that advocate. I mean, it takes so much courage and confidence, and then you just get tired. So maybe that's why sometimes people don't bother carrying on into coaching. It's just exhausting. And, and you have the example of the U.S. athlete who has withdrawn from the Paralympic Games because her organization hasn't been able to right. provide her with an accredited guide in order to have her perform. I mean, if that's not the epitome of not servicing our, our athletes and not not creating an equitable environment, I don't know what is. And we're, and, and, you know, we're acknowledging how far we've come, but that's where we are right now. That's not okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just like NCAA still didn't, you know, provided weight rooms that were so disparate, it was ridiculous. There's still these attitudes. So what do we, what do we do? Like we're sitting here getting furious and uh, put the rage aside. How do we make change? People in our, we got 30 people in the room and another 70 who are anxious. What can we do day to day? How can we rally together and make big change too? Because, you know, I've sat there and feel really frustrated about that athlete. And I think, okay, hey, what can I do? Oh, I feel so distant and, and just frustrated. What do you think? What are things that have occurred to you or that you've encountered so far that are working? I think, um, and I don't quite have an answer on this, so I'm sure other counterparts will jump in. But I do think about how do we increase people's risk tolerance to make changes to the system, right? And so, for example, I go back to that like metrics piece and I think about the cost it would take to get, uh, for example, we call it a PR1 boat in rowing. So that's somebody who uses their arms and shoulders. And the cost it would take to get that boat kind of up and going to the equivalent of what um, an able-bodied athlete at the same development level would access in terms of their boat, it's a much higher cost my belief is if we access that boat, these athletes will actually be able to um, be comfortable, healthier, because they're not getting like pressure sores from the crappy seat that they're sitting on or what have you, but also develop faster through the system because they're in just not even good equipment, but proper equipment, right? 
that really takes the leadership, uh, they need to take a risk on how they look at what equipment they provide and those kinds of pieces. Uh, and so it's, um, yeah, it's just like encouraging people to do that. And then I think once again, bringing more people on so you don't feel like you're the only person taking risks in those spaces to move forward. Yeah, I think building on that too, allowing it to be iterative. So I think when we talk, Jennifer, you talked about fear and I think fear stops people from starting, whether it's a coach starting, whether it's an organization starting, whether it's a participant starting. But if we really create an environment where it's okay to start in whatever way you start, as long as you have a commitment to continue to get better, continue to improve what you're doing, continue. Okay, we botched that up. I mean, Jennifer said, I'm worried about saying the wrong word. I'm always worried about saying the wrong thing. Um, but let's acknowledge where we've made a misstep. Let's, let's listen to the voices who can advise us on how to do it better. And then let's do it better. And let's continue that. And at the same time, so there's that sort of more patient iterative path, but at the same time, recognize where there are moments where you can push for a big change. You know, at the moment where a funding policy is put into place, at the moment where a strategic plan is put into place, where, where are those moments where you can just press hard and get a change um, that will hopefully impact the system going forward and recognize what those are and recognize where those real strong levers are. Unfortunately, um, as organizations, we're really responsive to our funders saying, you need to do it this way. And so as funders, there needs to be buy-in and an acknowledgement that that leaders based or sorry that values based leadership needs to translate into how you make your funding decisions. Yes, challenging, and we have lots of people in this little room right now. Everybody's on a board, right? So you have a chance to really challenge, and support, and encourage, but challenge as well. And uh, and the readiness is all right. Being ready to jump on those opportunities. There's a great quote, Pastor. Um, the chance. Chance favors the prepared mind. So, you know, these kinds of webinars and opportunities to explore and reflect are uh, readying us for those opportunities to speak up with confidence. Beautiful. Yeah, and I was also thinking, like, one of the things that I really experience in a coaching space is there is this this um, almost fear to allow things to change, right? And this fear to like try something and go, you know what, that just didn't work that well. Let's try something else. We are really stuck with this commitment to choosing our pathway and then sticking it, uh, even if it's like a plane going into the ground, right? Versus coming, versus reflecting both like in action and on action and then going, okay, how do we get a little bit comfortable changing this around as we move forward? But that once again comes to a value shift of going, well, how do we value curiosity and do we give people space to grow and play and have agency in their workspaces? Awesome. Talk to me about uh, ableism. That's come up a couple of times. What's that mean? Um, there seems to be a real duality. There's the para athlete and the able body. And we hear that language a lot. What do you think about that? What is ableism? Is there a problem with that duality? Are we shifting, expanding? What's happening? None of us want to take this on it. I know it's a big one. <laughs> it is a big one. And I think I'm still wrapping my head around it a little bit. Um, as, as someone who um, has sort of participated in able-bodied sport and has as someone who um, wasn't classified or I've seen as a disabled athlete in terms of the para world. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I'm super, super grateful for the support I received in participating in, um, in all sports. And um, I was encouraged by my teammates and my coaches to play basketball and volleyball, despite in volleyball getting called on carry every time I volleyed a ball. Um, I was always supported and that's, that's wonderful. Um, and so sometimes I was my worst enemy in terms of my ability, uh, believing I couldn't do things. Um, but on the flip side of it, uh, as I talked about before, that community really made a huge difference for me um, and knowing that I belonged in that community um, and finding out, finding people who were like me and uh, learning about resources and support, other ways of support were really, really important. So um, I don't know, I, not to put you on the spot, Sam, but like I've enjoyed our conversations about ableism. So um, 
I don't know if you want to add anything there. Yeah, I um, sometimes I get scared having the conversation about ableism. First of all, because I've never, I'm not a para-athlete, right? Uh, I've never identified as an athlete with a disability. And so then who am I to be there like stomping on about it in our like in our daily training environment when there's such a discourse and there's such a, a spectrum of the conversation. Like some athletes are like, I'm just here to train and put my head down. I don't want to talk about it. Other athletes are can like identify as disability advocates, right? Um, I do think that we are scared to acknowledge how much inherent ableism exists in our sports space. I think we're incredibly polite as Canadians. And so we're afraid to kind of like check each other and go, well, this is actually happening here and, and have those conversations in an eloquent way because so often I think people get very scared when whether you're calling out ableism or sexism or racism, uh, then all of a sudden you get this very tense, conflictual conversation. And then everybody's like, I never want to do that again. And I don't know how to challenge it. Um, but I do think getting more confident, acknowledging that the ableism exists um, and then going, okay, well now let's, we know that this needs to change um, and, and confronting it in a way where like, I really believe that in conflict, you need to almost get to that tension point where you've kind of got policy as well as those angry voices kind of going like knocking on the door going, this needs to change. And then being able to eloquently respond to that as you change your attitudes, policies, resources moving forward, um, which is the same thing we've been talking about all day. But um, I am yeah, very curious about how people address ableism, right? And, and how we get more confident talking about it. And this is maybe where that intersectionality comes in and is helpful, hey, because we, we see the same thing with racism, whereas, but all lives matter, you know, there's that defensiveness and conflict and the, the angry voices or sexism, not all men, you know, and it becomes about men versus women, that duality. And I see a bit of a hierarchy in terms of ability as well. And, and we need to ditch the hierarchy, man. <laughs> Just everybody's different. And that's where yeah. I'm loving the Olympics for, for bringing out, we're all from different nations. That's one way to identify, but, but you know, the indigenous will argue like that lacrosse team that we want to be from our indigenous nation. That's a nation too, right? Or the LBGTQ 2S plus, <laughs> I'm getting there. Um, are saying, you know, the pride games in a way too, right? What athletes won medals at the Olympics and highlighting that identity. And I love that. Can we move toward a diverse identity instead of this polarizing duality that there's only able and non-able? There's yeah. a lot of ability, yeah. Well, and I think like as a teacher, I think I'm always going back to education like and making people aware of, of things. Like um, I read something recently like, able-bodied people don't understand that a sidewalk is actually put in place for you to be able to get from A to B in a more efficient manner. So why is um, why is it putting an elevator in such a ordeal when someone who's able-bodied can walk up the stairs, but then someone who is using a wheelchair will not be able to get up those stairs. So just um, making more awareness and education on the needs of, of certain people. And, and building on that, I think when we talk about ableism, I think that there's also a thing within the Paralympic movement where, you know, so many of the stories are highlighted um, are certain class of athlete. And then, you know, we don't maybe see as much visibility for higher needs athletes and for athletes who, who um, use a power trainer, who have a higher level of disability. And so that there's this hierarchy within Parasport itself about who gets visibility, who has a stronger voice, you know, what gets better viewership, that kind of thing. And so I think we need a lot, we have a lot of work to do. Um, not just that sort of line between are you able-bodied, are you not, but all the way through our system and how do we embrace everybody and make sure that we're honoring everybody. I think, yeah, and I think that's a real like realignment of our values in sport because so often we value this higher, faster, stronger. And like, I think we're starting to get higher, faster, stronger figured out, right? It's not actually that exciting and nuanced anymore, right? Now it's sitting there going like, well, what is sport exactly like we did at the beginning of this call? Well, what does sport mean to all of us? And how do we amplify that a little bit differently to, to actually embrace the full 
um, the full room of people who access sport and what it means to them. Right? And if you if you think about the example of, of, of wheelchair rugby, which is one of the sports that is under our umbrella, you have a classification system that has uh, the ability to include people with a vast, di vast differences in level of functional ability. Um, and yet without that 0.5 or one point player with the highest um, or the least amount of functional ability, that athlete that, that everyone looks at, the, the, you know, the Zach Mandel that's like zipping down and scoring, without the Trevor Hirschfield who has set the picks and, 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 and made the play on the floor, that goal doesn't happen. And so that's sort of an example of, you know, the value across uh, one team, one sport, but should be across our whole system of how you, everybody has a, an important role, a valued role, has excellence in their role, um, and it's not tied to the level of functional ability that they might have. Beautiful. Yeah, these false hierarchies imposed. And then, you know, I love rugby. Rugby is a beautiful sport for that, right? Because it constantly embodies that idea that everybody has a role everybody has different abilities you know yeah 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 if we could just and and again in the Paris space I feel like we're highlighting it more effectively though these concepts that are so valuable to the world wonderful other questions from our participants we've got someone cheering on wheelchair rugby and can't wait to see it the broadcast prime time wonderful other comments, questions people have, or you'd like to uh, discuss? I think one of, uh, if anybody jumps in, but I think one of the things that I always, is really important to me talking to an audience is like, well, what skills do people feel they need to address these things? And, and one of them for me is always, and I always practice this because you get to those awkward moments and you don't really know how to challenge it, but go, what are the lines that I have prepared to address the uncomfortable situation? Or to, or to ask the question when I am a little bit uncertain or a little bit fearful so that you don't get stuck in that moment and you can actually use it to transform and, and address those things that you think about later on in the shower and you're like, I should have said it then. So really encouraging people to practice their, their set of lines or their statements that they have when they come up in those, those ableist moments or that moment where you're interacting with somebody and you're like, well, what do you need in this space? Um, to be able to then actually do something right there on the spot is really important. Right. Without it feeling like sparks, right, are flying or without feeling like you're going to be shut down or dismissed or it lead to conflict. So what are some things that have worked for people? You know, I love the language from your webinar yesterday of um, reminding people, um, you know, it, that's a person with a disability. And we're moving toward that for these reasons and taking the time to explain why, right? Why it's important to acknowledge a person first or remind people of that. And it doesn't have to be a judgment or an attack, but we can all be reminding each other of the importance of certain language. What else has been working? You know, Megan, I loved your example of the elevator versus sidewalk. I mean, God, sidewalks cost a ton. <laughs> it's a huge investment and it, and it's available to everybody. And so why wouldn't we make everything available to everybody? Yes. Or are there other examples like that that you use? I'm stealing that one for sure. I, or, I think, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say, I, I think it's, I think it's, um, what we talked about starting from the beginning and and not making an assumption of a certain kind of person that's going to enter your space that that we're open to um, designing in a way that um, tries as best as possible from the beginning to be accessible and inclusive but then also understanding that we're going to learn along the way that we're going to be open to change we're going to be open to understanding where we might be falling short and how we can improve the situation and at the same time, not allowing excuses. And by excuses, I mean, mm -hmm. well, there's not enough. We spent all the money over here. There's not enough money over there. Well, I'm sorry, that's not good enough. We've got to find a way. Um, there's generally a way. Let's find it. Uh, you, you referenced earlier that the Rio um, 26 games for the Paralympics nearly didn't happen. And they nearly didn't happen because they spent all the money on the Olympic Games, right? And the, the, the Paralympic Games were an afterthought that, well, okay, yeah, we'll do them. It, that's no, <laughs> you know, this it's not an afterthought. You are committed to two sets of games. 
you need resources for two sets of games. And that's, that's a symbol of how Parasport has been treated not only in our country, but across in, across the world. Well, first we'll do it. We'll, we'll make sure we have all the resources for our able-bodied athletes. And then if we have some resources left over, then we'll try and include the people with disabilities because that's a good thing to do. It's like, no, you are a sport organization from the get-go. This is your membership. The resource allocation reflects that you have a responsibility for all Canadians, regardless of their um, you know, physical attributes or you know, what community they might be from or you know, what intersectionality they, they, they come as a whole person to you. You, 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 you. We're beyond that now. We need to look at the whole picture. Yeah, and I think socially as well, one of the things is um, so often that the Paris system is kind of squeezed into the able-bodied system, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of going, well, how do we actually, and this is why I love this space, is how do we highlight the things that are actually being done a lot better, in my opinion, in this space? Because we do, I think, do intersectionality better in the parasport space. We do um, have these beautiful moments of like community and connection in the parasport space, which is really the direction sports seems to be going in when you listen to the athlete narrative. Uh, and so I think it's, once again, and that's that shift in your attitude and mindset about this space might actually be leading the way, and we don't really see it like that enough. In my and, and I think too, recognizing that there are different models. So I think for a long time, there was a model that, well, you incorporate the athlete with disability into your able-bodied program, and that's the ideal. And that, that integration is the perfect scenario. And I think, I hope what we've learned over the last two decades is that that's not the ideal. In some cases, it works amazingly well. And, and so let's embrace that. In other cases, the athlete needs or the program needs its own environment and its own set of training and coaching and all of that kind of thing to be the best that they can be. Um, and that, you know, whether that's at the grassroots or at the high performance level, we need to be broad in our thinking and understand that there are a number of models that we need to embrace so that the athletes are getting what they need. And so if you go back to your mountain biking example that Samantha brought at the beginning, they had a rider with the adaptive rider. Um, the adaptive rider led the way, did their thing, but there was an accommodation that, okay, if, you know, if they need this person, if something happens, that person is there. You know, there were some, some changes to the trail or some, but at the end of the day, that athlete had what, they're in, had what they need. And yes, it was the first time. And is there improvements that will be made? Absolutely. Will there be a feedback loop? Absolutely. But, you know, that was designed, I'm assuming, with the athlete in mind. And how do we get from A to B? And now we'll go down the alphabet till we get to the end. And we are doing, hopefully, um, something amazing. Which is the whole point of sport, isn't it? <laughs> you know, with the athlete in mind, imagine. Uh, Dan O'Thorne, I had him on a webinar a while ago, and we talked about the uh, Indigenous Games. And this idea, I'm glad you brought it up, Gail, of integration, assimilation, you know, as being somehow the ideal. And, and he's like, no, we want our own game. We need to have our own games for a while for a lot of different reasons, partly because sometimes the needs are just different, but also because of this idea that, like Sam was alluding to, you know, that we're leading the way in a lot of a lot of ways. And so we want to highlight that and retain our uh, distinct identity for a while longer. Yeah, wonderful to see. Any other comments on that? That idea of, you know, why isn't there just one games and where we integrate the two? There are probably some challenges, obviously, to doing that. But is that something we should aspire to or it, should it always be separate Paralympic and Olympic? Yeah, I had questions to launch at the end of it. <laughs> one minute. Come on, let's go. <laughs> I would, I would be interested to hear what Megan's perspective is on that as opposed to. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I think I'm just following up with what you said, Jen, about there needs to be some awareness first before and some time for it to develop before we incorporate both together, I think. And I mean, it's a huge topic. It's the Olympics are already so expensive um, and there's so many people. And so to drop in an extra million people to just run the para games like it, it yeah it would just be a huge huge um thought that would need to be um well thought out anyway i, I won't go into i'm thinking logistics like what sports might get cut what what how would be you know but um i really think that it's still like the paralympic movement is such a is still in its infancy in my opinion like it's it's less than 100 years old i think it's in its 70s 
at 70 years old or something like that. It's, it really hasn't been around for very long. And um, the awareness piece around it is still needs to grow before it gets introduced into one games. So that's my personal opinion. Um, yeah, it, it would, I think right now would take away the special bit of what it is and what it's about um, if it was included in all as one. And I'm a sport junkie, so more games. I just want, I wouldn't want to play the two or lose anything, right? I like the idea of having the I'm board. very curious about what's like what this conversation will look like in 10 years because mm -hmm. we at the Olympics just started seeing mixed gender events, right? Right. Uh, I to mention well, that. As all of these kind of nuances emerge, I'm just like, well, what could it look like? 10, 15, 20 years from now, I do think it will be a very different scene than what we have now. Yeah, talk about um, Parasport taking the lead on that, right? Like Absolutely. myself being in a Cox 4 with men and women training together, like that's, um, yeah, just an example of how Paris leading the way there. Leading the way in so many ways. And, and is that acknowledged, you know, like where did the, the mix relay, do they even understand where it came, the idea came from? It's so funny. I talk about, you know, again, intersectionality there is, is remarkable because the same kind of phenomenon happened with race and gender. <sighs> Off we go. Okay, I want to wrap it up. I think we're at 1.30 or thereabouts and Amara is saying her farewells to everybody and letting them know that the recording will be sent out. And I really want to thank our guests today, today, Gail Hamamoto and Megan Montgomery and Samantha Heron for joining us. What a good discussion revealed uh, some superb insights, but also some, I think, really concrete avenues and, and pathways, this idea of language, having some lines ready, practice them, rehearse them, uh, get comfortable with them, make sure you're educated, but also develop the tools like some of the examples that people have shared and the stories, steal those stories. Stories are so powerful for people and, and land really well and help them remember the whys and in what ways we can make change. And that general insight that we're, you know, we're trying to embrace diversity it isn't about dualities or hierarchies we're we're completely infinitely unique and the better we embrace that the more we're living the promise of sport frankly uh, of any great team right the sum of the parts the whole always being great of the sum of parts we can but we have to make it actually work don't we we can't just kind of hope it will work so love that this idea of para leading the way as well and how, what we can do to showcase those leadership qualities. Thank you. And farewell to all of our wonderful participants who uh, posted in the chat and shared. Thank you, your support and uh, comments and opinions. We're, we'd love to hear from you. I will send out the PowerPoint as well, because in there we have some contact information, but you know, it's easy to find us on social now and everybody has a little present somewhere. And we will see you again in September. We have one more, another webinar. I, Amara and I want it to go on forever, but this one will be on sport as education. We've got some great, Cheryl Bernard is going to join us and Gary Barber and Doug Tate, some great educators in the sport realm. Thank you all. Really appreciate your comments and, and your participation and spending 90 minutes with us at Railroads. Take care. <laughs>